Good afternoon, everyone. Before we start, we want to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional land of the Southern Paiute peoples, past and present, and honor the gratitude, the land itself, and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. My name is Sasha Thompson. I'm the Inclusion Marketing Lead at AWS, and I manage the We Power Tech program. We Power Tech was launched in 2017 as an initiative of AWS with a goal of building a future of technology which is diverse, inclusive, and accessible. Our mission is to work with underrepresented technologists and provide access and opportunities through trainings and platforms globally. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our moderator for this session, Teresa Carlson, Vice President of Worldwide Public Sector Sales at Amazon Web Services. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa founded the Worldwide Public Sector in 2010 and since has driven the business's growth. Today, more than 4,000 government agencies, more than 9,000 education institutions, and more than 24,000 nonprofit organizations around the world use AWS. Teresa has over 20 years of executive experience and has earned industry recognition for her leadership. In 2019, she was inducted into the WASH 100, a premier group of public and private sector leaders with expertise in the government space. She is the founding board member of the Halcyon House Board of Directors and has previously been named one of Business Insider's most important people in cloud computing, as well as Washingtonian's 100 most powerful women. Before moving into technology, Teresa specialized in healthcare as a practitioner and consultant initially, and then as a business manager and area vice president. She earned her undergraduate and master's, science, master's of science degrees in communications and speech language pathology from Western Kentucky University. Additionally, Teresa has been a strong advocate for empowering women in the technology field. And that passion has led to the creation of the WePower Tech program. So without further ado, please welcome Teresa Carlson. Sasha, thank you. Okay, this is so fun to see so many of you in here today. I'm glad to see the room is filled. And we have, a. in fact, I remember the first year we did this, eight years ago at the first reInvent, we had a panel with a very small room. We had a luncheon. We did have um, a, a line of individuals trying to get in, which were also men and women, which is nice. I see a mixed audience here today, which is fantastic. But now, fast forward eight years ago, and we have many more females in the audience. Uh, so our mix of individuals, still not where we want it to be for sure, but better. And we have multiple sessions for you now around diversity and inclusion. So I really uh, appreciate each and every one of you being here today. I hope you walk out of here with some new knowledge and information that you didn't have previously. And excuse me if I sound a little bit like a frog, because I think I've already been talking too much and my phone's going off in the middle of this. So, uh, and it's my mom, in fact, just so you know. I should answer and say hi. My mom is 90 years old and she is still uses her iPhone, texts me. She's amazing. So um, I'll make sure and tell her she called me in the middle of this session. Uh, but thank you again. And before we get started, I'm, I have three amazing, amazing women and panelists here today. And I want each one of them to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit, a bit about who they are. And then we'll jump into the questions. Eva, let's start with you. Um, Eva Chen, and my resume is very short. I'm with Trey Micro for 32 years. And that's it. <laughs> Yo, and she, yeah. And let me just say, Eva has been, she and her team have been an amazing advocate and partner of both AWS and We Power Tech. So thank you so much for that, Eva, being here today. Our pleasure. Hi, I'm Amy, Amy Gradnick. Um, I'm the Technology Chief Operating Officer at SP Global, which is a company in New York City, headquartered in New York City. Um, I've been in financial services and technology for about the last 15 years, and I spent a few years in nonprofit as well. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we live in New Jersey now, and uh, I have two kids, one daughter and one son. 
Thank you. Lakeisha, thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lakeisha Grant Shepherd, and I am the CEO of Virtual Enterprise Architects. We are an award winning small business, woman owned small business, um, operating mostly in the federal sector. Um, I have been the owner and founder for about 12 years now. I've been in the public sector for 20 plus years, and um, our company has, of course, been a partner of AWS, and, um, and we're very happy to be here. Thank you, Lakeisha, and you're a mom now, you were saying. Yes, I'm actually a mom of four. A mom, a new mom. Oh. Yep, but a new mom oh. of a, oh. eight months old tomorrow. <laughs> so I think we should get into that. All things are possible, right? Yes. See, as a CEO running her own business, that's really exciting. So let's jump in. We are going to talk about growth mindset today and the belief in the basic qualities that things you can cultivate through your efforts, your strategies, and things that really help you grow, and that so neither your brain nor your abilities are predestined or fixed. Yeah. And it's the notion that becoming is better than simply being. So Eva, let's start with you. Um, again, thanks again for all you and your team are doing and just being here today. But your path to co-founding Trend Micro was definitely not a straight line. <laughs> and something I certainly identify with, having started micro as a speech and language pathologist. Oh. Uh, but before Trend Micro, you studied philosophy. Yes. Uh, you came to the US to graduate school, and then you became a writer for a time, which I think is really interesting. What were the most important skills you learned from those early experiences and leveraged and really to drive uh, the success of launching Trend Micro? Hmm. I was uh, actually a sports writer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, a journalist. So I would say uh, philosophy teach me one thing. Look at things from different angle. So just for fun, can you, can you see how, how, can you try to make a cross with one hand without bending your, broken your fingers? Can you do that? A cross? With one hand. With one hand. Okay, very simple. Do this and then look at this way. Did you see one? Do you see a cross? Okay. Change your angle. <laughs> Change your angle to look at things yeah. will enable you to see a lot of things. And that's what philosophy ta taught me. That's really good. Yeah. Philosophy has so many different kind of schools. And the world is the same world, but you just have a different angle to look at it. I love that. The second one is the sports journalist. As a journalist, what it told me is never afraid of new subject. Because as, as a journalist, you need to cover all type of different, uh, different subjects, right? So sports, I, I don't play football, I don't play tennis, <laughs> but you need to learn to just adapt to any new subject, not be afraid of any new subject. And those are the two things I learned from my, my past and probably you talk about the growth mindset. Yes. If you can change your angle and you, if you can always learn new subject, you can grow. You know, I think it's a really important concept because one of the things at AWS we talk about a lot is we have this leadership principle called be right a lot. And it's kind of the same philosophy where you may be right about something in your life or business that day or that week. Yes. But and then two weeks, it could change. And a growth mindset, you have to have the perspective in business and in life that you can change it based on the needs of what's happening, yes. right? You can't keep doing the same old thing if it doesn't apply anymore. And I think that's a good point of philosophy. You can kind of apply what you're right. talking about looking at things. From right, one of the uh, culture in Tremicro is change. And uh, sometimes I change my mind too much yeah. that, uh, <laughs> My my engineer would say, Eva, you didn't say you say this different thing yesterday, and I always say, well, today I become smarter. <laughs> so. Oh, that's so true. But, but I think it is good, and it's good to debate those ideas, yeah. too, which is really important. Well, th thank you for sharing that. So, uh, Lakeisha, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to you for a minute. Um, I I. I know that you founded your business in 2007. I don't even think you told your mom that you had founded your business. Was it mom or mom or not mom. sure what you talking about mom, yeah. mommy, mommy. You know. <laughs> uh, but you also created nine core principles with your business, and I have them here, which are volunteerism, integrity, 
relentlessness, transformation, unity, amplification, which I love, learning, excellence, and accountability. And we also at Amazon have our leadership principles, which we are really, we hire people, we review people, and we promote people on those principles. It's a really important concept for us. We, we literally run the business. But I'm sure you'll agree that having a clear set of tenants really creates kind of a strong culture. Can you share a few of the ways that your employees have embraced these principles and how you use them as a growth mindset in terms of career and opportunities with the business? Well, out of the nine core values, I really would like to highlight three of them, which is um, volunteerism, unity, and learning. Um, volunteerism and unity are very closely aligned because uh, without service you know, to each other and service throughout our communities and our work environments, it's very hard to advance the common goals and principles of not only our organization, but most importantly, their own individual um, professional development goals as well. Um, we provide all kinds of ways that they can volunteer within the community as well as internally within our organization. And um, one of the, th the ways that we reward that volunteerism is through micro bonuses in which our employees get rewarded for helping others with some of the non-traditional tasks. Like for example, we have um, working mothers and, and, and others who have um, diverse work schedules. And in a team environment, you know, you have to sort of give and take as to you know, achieving those goals and, and how we're gonna get, it, get across that finish line. And um, one of the ways that our teams sort of come together and the individuals come together is they, um, they work on not only their work schedules, but their common tasks together. And, and if there's a deficiency in one particular area and someone steps in and uh, helps them achieve that particular area, they get a, a little micro bonus. So it increases their productivity and increases their ability to want to help mm -hmm. and to want to volunteer to help others. And I really think that that is something that anyone who's trying to advance and grow, with it, grow their careers, that they have to have that mindset that they must volunteer and they must serve others. Um, in addition to that, from a learning perspective, um, our professional development frame, um, framework and our plans um, sort of highlight the individual career paths and, and training objectives that will force them to um, make it to the next level. And um, with that requirement for all of our you know, individual employees, it's a group or collective effort to make sure that everyone achieves those individual development plans. Um, and so I would really, of course, want everyone in the audience and, um, and others who are looking to advance their growth and careers to make sure they have a solid professional development plan and ensure that they're constantly meeting those goals and they're constantly looking for ways to continue their education. I think that's so important. You know, my team now, I have teams in 42 countries around the world. Yeah. And the, still the number one thing that I hear from them, we have not-for-profits as part of my business, is they love to volunteer. I mean, I think people want to be able to give back. They want something that they can connect. And they, of course, can do that on their own. But to your point, as a group, as a team, as a company, it kind of pulls you together. And I'll get these like notes. We do the American Heart Association walk as a team every year. And the team, like they let, they volunteer, they do it, they raise money. And I encourage them to do their own thing, but it's, it just binds you in a different way if people understand. And I think my business, a lot, you all, a lot of you probably have public sector. It's a mission oriented world and you've got to participate in that. And I wanted to also say, you want, uh, Keisha, like Keisha, your company won the VEA for VEA, your company won this, the CEO Report for Corporate Culture Award. I'm sorry, 2018, I really messed that up. Yeah. The CEO Report Corporate Culture Award in 2018, and you took your mom to that event. And I love that you did that because I love to take my mom still. I will take, put her in my pocket and take her wherever I can. Uh, she's so amazing. I thought that was really good that you shared that with your mom and your family when you, when you did that. So, uh, so Amy, let's jump to you. Sure. Uh, on that same topic of kind of culture and growth uh, mindset, um, S&P Global has experienced kind of some major changes over the last four years, including a name change yes. from McGraw-Hill Financial, which I know a lot of you knew. I don't know if, they, if this audience maybe didn't know that, right. to S&P Global. And um, you've established the establishment, which I love, of a DevOps culture, which of course, we promoted AWS, and the introduction of new technologies around machine learning and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what steps S&P Global is taking to ensure kind of the education 
of these new methodologies within the company and how you're using them? Yes, absolutely. So S&P has been on a journey. It's a cultural and technological, excuse me, technology transformation. Um, we are a data and analytics company, and we want to ensure that our staff are well prepared as we move um, into more and more uh, focus on data, more and more focus on what's happening in the global economy. So we created Essential Tech, and Essential Tech is our platform to provide our employees, all employees, not employees in technology, but all of our 22,000 employees with a platform so that they can become more tech savvy. Mm -hmm. And we're very proud that in the last couple of years, we've had over 100,000 course completions. And that goes across topics like DevOps yeah. and cloud, agile, as well as cybersecurity. So we want everyone at the company to embrace the transformation. Uh, McGraw-Hill was, was once a publishing company, uh, and then we were a financial company, and now we're S&P Global. And so that rebranding in the market and on the street was very, very successful. But the only way that that success continues is if the employees uh, live it and value it as well. Um, in addition to this, uh, we also provide online training. Uh, we partner with various online platforms for deeper technical training um, for the technologists as well. And then in, on top of that, we have leadership training for all levels in the organization, for brand new managers, mid-level managers, as well as um, staff that have senior level experience to continue their own leadership journey. Mm -hmm. um, and we want the staff to continue that and to continue focusing on themselves. And something that you said that resonated with me was something that worked today might not work tomorrow. And we want, we want our employees to embrace that mindset and be more agile and be able to embrace change as we continue to move, fo move forward with our own uh, transformation. It's it's such an important concept because we talk about a day one mentality at Amazon, and I think one of our greatest fears is we'll be a day two mentality. Mm -hmm. and, and what that really means is, you know, day one we try to behave and act like a startup, and it, it really is what allows us. I'm, I'm the birth of a day one mentality where, you know, uh, Jeff and Andy kind of said we need, we, we've never done public sector, but I feel like we could use it. Our customers need cloud and we develop the business and we've done, I've done my own things like that now. And it's really about how do you continue to stay fresh? And I think the training and education elements of what you're doing, Amy, is such an important part for the, for the employees so they feel like they're always ready to take on that next great challenge of whatever it is. Um, I wanna jump for a minute a little bit about failure and how you kind of embrace and react to failure I think we all, I, I think we all have had failures in our career and in our businesses, one that, that we talk about a little bit at Amazon is, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Fire Phone. Ooh, it didn't turn out so well. However, um, Jeff talks about this a lot. We didn't really see it as a big failure. We learned a lot from it. And we actually redeployed those developers and engineers to other projects. And we've also used a lot of the components from the Fire Phone in many of, other, of our hardware devices. And if you look at where we are today, we're launching hardware devices uh, almost as fast as we're launching cloud services, uh, which is kind of David Lemp run, runs that group uh, for Jeff. And it's interesting, but we've learned kind of from what we didn't know in hardware. But I would say that's the failure that we learned from that turned into something that we maybe unexpected. But that's kind of what you've got to do, I think, in business. Could you all kind of share something in either your life or your career? And Eva, let's start with you. Oh, which value you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a very famous value in Tremicro. We call it 594. Yeah. Four months uh, I into this uh, CEO role. I was the CTO and I into this CEO role. Tremicro is a cybersecurity company and uh, antivirus company. So we download, we do the virus pattern update every day, every, every hour actually. Mm -hmm. And that day, there's this pattern number 594 downloaded to millions of the PC in the world. Mm -hmm. It get the PC into an infinity loop trying to read and read, so the PC is locked up. So, sounds like it's just a lock up, but uh, Tremicro is a, a 
very big uh, cybersecurity company in Japan. Oh, yeah. And that day, the, you know the rapid train, the, the express train in mm -hmm. Japan, it never miss that day the express train cannot run because they cannot issue the tickets because of Trend Micro. And uh, it was, um, <laughs> you see, I was- I want to uh, thank you almost. Yeah, <laughs> that must no. have been painful. <laughs> I know, I was the CTO, so I was the one that designed the whole system, so mm -hmm. I take it as my own value. Yeah. And uh, you cannot imagine when I go to, and I just four months, into my CEO role, I go to Japan. I need to wear mm. all black. I need to bow and apologize to everyone about this. And uh, it's, it's bad enough to have the incidents, mm. not to mention that I'm the first woman CEO and I don't speak Japanese. I, I don't even know how to bow properly. <laughs> <laughs> according to them. So that was a big value. But at that, at that time, when I need to bow and apologize, I did one thing that is even worse. I say, I'm not going to uh, find out who made the mistake. I'm not going to, people ask, well, what is the root cause? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I say, very simple. People write, write programs, so it's people's mistake. The program was written, the pattern file was written wrongly. Mm -hmm. That caused this. But I'm not going to find them because the reason that this person, this engineer, he can come to work every day. He, he don't need to take the risk and write this pattern to detect the so-called polymorphic virus mm -hmm. that need to decrypt. He tried to decrypt the virus so that he can find the virus. I think he or she doesn't need to do this, mm -hmm. but he take the risk of doing this. So I'm not going to punish, because if I do anything, I even ask who did this, without punishment will stop the whole innovation in Trend Micro. So I'm not going to. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so that was the big value, but out of that, because I didn't punish, and I flew into Philippines, which is my subsidiary of doing all this pattern update. Mm -hmm. And that night, and I was just saying, let's continue to do that. But let's think about what if we don't need to deliver this pattern? Let's look at the feature. What if we don't need to deliver the pattern to the computer, each of the computer? Then maybe we, we won't cause this problem. And that was our first cloud thinking. Back then, we don't know what is cloud. That yeah. was 2005. There's no world as yeah. cloud, yeah. like That's AWS. Right. That's right. It's true. All we're thinking is just, it's like, a, like a, uh, when you check the phone number, mm -hmm. you call and someone will tell you. Yeah, exactly. Right? Phone so <laughs> there's, a, there's a pattern, one, two, three. I call someone and say, one, two, three, is that good or bad? Yeah. You come back. So from there, we were the first uh, security company that come up with security from the cloud. Yes, and thank so. you for that. But that's a, that's a rough one, and I think, you know, we've also learned at AWS the transparent component of if you, if yes. there is a failure, admitting that, and then yes. sharing what you're doing about it, because you can't hide these things. Customers yeah. today, you, you have to be open, and you do have to say, look, here, here's what happened, and here's what we're going to do about it. Right. And you got to move on, and then you got to learn from it. I think that and that right. one. I think it is very important that you make sure that your employee understand what's important. Yes, it's doing really the right point. thing, yep. making a mistake is not, is, um, it's, it's okay. Yeah, as long it's as how your you purpose was right. Exactly. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's very, that's very good. Amy, let's jump to you. What about? Sure. Can you think of it? I'm sure you probably have views. Like <laughs> I've never taken down a transportation system. <laughs> uh, I, I feel a lot better, actually, right now. So thank you for sharing that. But if, if any successful leader tells you that they've never had a failure, um, then they're a fake or they're lying to you. 
Uh, you cannot succeed without having some mistakes and failures. There's day-to-day -day small ones, who hasn't sent an email to the wrong person? Uh, it, you know, it happens regularly. Who's moving too fast and makes a typo or forgets to attach a file or something silly like that? Or it can be large and organizationally impacting, um, like you were saying, Eva. Uh, I definitely have had organizationally impacting failures. Um, I once migrated desktops that were being used as servers that I, of course, didn't know were being used as servers um, and took down a fairly significant business application that couldn't clear trades when the beginning of day trading started. Um, and back to what, uh, Teresa, what you said, you have to take accountability, you have to be transparent, uh, you have to make those hard calls, you have to stand up and say, yes, this happened and here's what we're doing to fix it. Be honest, be truthful, don't overpromise and overcommit to something that you can't deliver. Um, I've sat in front of clients and, and had to explain what happened because a network went down or a data center went down. Mm -hmm. uh, something wasn't compatible or wasn't working. And, and so you have to apologize, of course, take the <laughs> accountability, whether it was your fault, someone on your team, or someone you don't even know. Uh, you have to realize and, and be empathetic with who you're speaking to because it impacted somebody on the other end. Mm -hmm. Whether it's an employee that, that couldn't log into something or whether it's a client that couldn't run their business. And again, what Teresa said, and more importantly, you know, everyone says fail fast, but to me, it's more along the lines of how you recover, and you should recover gracefully. You have to acknowledge the team that helped you get through it, because no matter what happens, any sort of significant failure, you're not going to fix it on your own. You need to call those trusted advisors and get your team to rally, to stand behind you and to fix the problem, and then make sure that everyone knows in the end what happened so that you can learn from it. And then take some time at the end to reflect and say, how did we do? Not with the failure, but how did we do with the recovery? Did we treat mm -hmm. each other well? Did we do a good job? And you know, make sure that you recognize those people that came to the table. I love what you said earlier about micro bonuses. You know, make sure that you're recognizing who's there to, to deal with this and, and work through it. And I think it's incredibly important. And then you as a team also become stronger together mm -hmm. because you lived through that and you succeeded and you survived because really even if you take down a transportation system, you can survive on the other end. Um, and I think that was a great story. So thank you for sharing it. Appreciate Amy, it. thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Lakeisha, what about you? What, what, what's the failure you can share and uh, the recovery plan around that of what well, you learn? Honestly, the recovery plan, Amy is I think already sort of summed up what to do. But uh, for me, early in my career, I was sort of the stereotypical um, worker who just got out of college, fresh out of college, wanting to prove themselves and make a, a name for themselves. And so I was pretty much a loner because I focused strictly on the work and um, very transactional with my, um, my other teammates as well as um, other employees. And because I was so transactional and just focused on the work, I um, didn't build any relationships. And um, I know that that's consistently an, an issue for a lot of people is not just, you know, you know, a failure of mine, but early on that really impacted my trajectory as far as my career because I really wasn't open and I wasn't um, vulnerable enough to, um, to work with others and to share with others and experience life with others. Uh, and that uh, failure was brought to my attention by my manager at that time, um, Mala Mittal. So I'm 5'1", she was all of 4'10", <laughs> not even 100 pounds. So I had a good 70 pounds on her probably <laughs> or so. And so for her to be such a little power, powerhouse of a, of a woman, um, she pulled me aside and said, you know, you can't look at life strictly um, in your, you know, from your myopic perspective. You have to um, wanna work with the rest of the team. And, and she basically laid out how she migrated to the US and her struggles to get to the US and her family struggles and how um, she became so successful um, at, at our particular company at that time. And so when she shared her experiences, that really motivated me to look outside of myself and to try to make this extroverted introvert want to work with others and want to talk with others. And that was a failure early on that I'm glad that I had because that allowed me to be more open once I was able to, um, to move forward in my career. And I think that's something that a lot of people, other people also have 
um, as, as a failure and as a um, personality flaw um, that really impacts their growth in their yeah. particular positions. No, it's a really good point. You know, it's interesting. I always, one of the interview questions I always ask uh, every, everyone I interview is, <clears throat> tell me about a failure. And if they say, oh, I really don't have any major ones, they're like, done. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that, you, everybody has had failures because it's about, you know, again, can you, can you recognize that, you, that these occurred? And can you recognize what you did about it? You know, and that it was, it was part of your growth. It wasn't a failure, it was actually a growth. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into um, kind of the area of what I call taking a seat at the table for women. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that, I, that I talk about a lot is taking a seat at the table. Once you have the opportunity as a female to actually be there taking a seat and having a voice and not allowing someone to do mansplaining for you, <laughs> but actually, you know, have, and I still see that a lot today. Um, can you all kind of talk about how you think once you get a seat at the table, how it's important to make that contribution? So let's start, we'll just start back with you. Well, um, there's times when you have to sort of recognize um, when to speak and when not to speak. So sometimes you may be in an environment where um, it could be disruptive to the flow and the, of the work. I'm very cognizant of time. I'm one of those people where I'm always looking at the clock. I was just looking at the clock a second ago. <laughs> and, and I don't like to waste time. And so that personal anxiety forces me to determine whether or not I'm going to say something right then and there or I'm going to pull someone aside to make, you know, or to talk um, with them about that particular area um, of focus. But um, if it's disruptive, I normally pull them aside. But if it's something that's gonna add value to that particular discussion, then I have no problems or qualms, if you can't tell, in voicing my opinion and also um, providing my suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a, a personal, again, it's something that's um, internal to everyone as far as um, if they have the confidence in order to speak out and actually voice their opinions when they're in those types of environments. And that level of comfort and that le level of, um, of, of knowing that they can add value to that discussion is something that's uh, sort of unique and innate to everyone here. And it's, it's a personal journey that everyone sort of has mm -hmm. to take. Now with me, I'm very confident because I've, I've knocked down a lot of doors and I have accomplished a lot from, from where I've started. And because of that, I'm very confident in knowing that I'm gonna add value to the discussion. And so it's very hard for me to back down yeah. <laughs> because I know what I know yeah. and I know what I can add. Um, but that's a personal thing for me. And the only thing I could suggest for others is that they, um, if they don't have that voice and if they need to find that voice, that they look at some, um, some inspirational avenues to help them get there. Well, you all are senior women though here. It's not like, you are going to have a voice because you obviously made it to where you are because you had a voice and you took that opportunity to voice it when you were there. I think what we need to do if you, you know, how do we get the individuals here that don't always feel like they have a voice or they're getting a voice? What are some ideas for them? You have, Eva, what do you, <laughs> like when you're at your own meetings, like how do you make sure people have a voice? Um, we, we usually make sure that in the meeting, we use voting system, mm -hmm. you know, just blind voting and mm -hmm. uh, use app for people to vote so that everybody can talk. But I do want to mention one thing, my personal experience. When I first got the seats or when I start, um, I was the co-founder, right? And uh, you know, actually being a woman, if you, I don't know if you have that, but you are afraid of success. You have a subconscious of afraid of being successful because usually people seeing a successful woman is like she's a tiger woman, she's strong, she's aggressive. And uh, by the way, I, I also have two kids. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so you subconsciously, you be afraid of success. So recognize that then you can have your own voice. Don't be afraid of a success. And uh, I, I give a, advice to some of the younger women. I think I'm more, much more senior here. We're, we're so young, yeah, we're just getting going. <laughs> so um, I, I said, pick up something that you're afraid of mm -hmm. and then overcome it. For me, I'm afraid of butterfly. 
since I was little. Mm -hmm. So when I, I don't know why, but butterfly, if you look at their hair, it looks very terrible. Like a person without a, without a nose. And like. So anyway, when I first become CEO, I say I want to pick up something. I, I overcome my fear. Mm -hmm. So I actually buy those uh, butterfly that they, uh, that butterfly they ping on the, on there, and I put it on my desk, on my, my bedroom. Yeah. I just force myself to look at that, mm -hmm. just to overcome it. Well, it's a muscle you're building again. Yes. Like, you know, fear is a mindset to yes. a lot of things. And exactly. It is, it, I just, we had students here from a local high school, and we always do an event with them here, and I noticed when I was asking them questions, you know, they're looking down, and I always encourage them, come up here and let me, let me you know, yeah, come up here, shake my hand. Speak, you know, right? and, and, I, and I taught them about, look, this is a muscle you're going to build over time. And I think it is very similar for a lot of women. It's you've got to do it. It's, a, yes. you, it's hard if you're sitting at a table with a bunch of men and they are very, you know, they, they, they feel very opinionated. They're, they have a topic. And I, I tell even a lot of our engineers and de developers, they have, yes, you know, men, and this is not a bad thing because you need both, men and women, to do all the work. It's why you need the 50-50. But men will build to tinker because they like to do that. Women want to build most of the time for a purpose. And I see that in young girls all the time in all the right. schools that we work in. So some of these things, it is a different kind of model in which they communicate. But I think what you're talking about, like that fear, how do you build the muscle around the fear? Amy, what about yeah, you? Any I, ideas for the women here? Yeah, I, I mean, I and think the men. I think might anyone not feel like they have a voice. <laughs> of course, you know, anyone. If you, if you're finding that you're not voicing your opinions or, or that you are disagreeing, but not you know overly so um, in a group, get yourself somebody that's in those meetings that can help you. It's a lot easier when you're bringing ideas to the table when you know you have somebody's support, mm -hmm. anybody's support. And, and just having one person that you know you can trust, that when you speak up and you wanna say, you know, maybe I disagree with that and here's why, make sure you have a why, uh, then you have somebody that's gonna back you up and support you. And it gets easier the more you do it. I failed every public speaking class I've ever taken. <laughs> every single one. <laughs> Everyone. And eventually I got to the point where I just avoided them and I'm still not sure how, but I did graduate <laughs> college and, and an MBA, but I never ever finished a public speaking course. And it's not till I gave a eulogy at a funeral of someone that I love dearly that I got through it. And I realized, well, if I could do that, my gosh, why is this so difficult? Yeah, what was it? What was in my head? It's like the butterfly, right? Mm -hmm. What's in your head that's causing you this intense reaction? So that's the other thing. Reflect back and figure out what's going on with it. What's, what's happening? What is it all about? Maybe something happened when you were a kid and you don't even know. Maybe it's some other experience you had, but you can get through that. And also, it's okay to just not be good at something, right? But if you find that you're struggling and not being able to bring your whole self to work or not being able to show up in those difficult meetings and having a buddy doesn't help, maybe look at where you're at. Maybe the culture isn't right for you, right? And maybe it's time to evaluate where you're at in your career and what else you want for yourself. Well, and Lakeisha had the leadership principle of amplification, which I think is a good point, like having others kind of amplify. If you can do that, it's helpful. If you have a buddy system for amplification, it's a good, it's a good way to get started. And you know, it sounds kind of silly, but practicing these things because it's back to failure. These are not always going to go well. 90% of the meetings I'm in, we're like, was that a good meeting or not? We kind of <laughs> laugh about it because every meeting is like a debate and it's a good, like, we're like, these are hard topics that we want to push through and they're, they're hard. And I'm uncomfortable a lot of times because it's not, like, women don't tend to want to get into the right. breath debating. It's just not our, and I told Andy one day, I was laughing, we were talking about kind of being more. I said, remember, women speak 20,000 words a day to a man, 7,000. He goes, what? I said, yes, absolutely. And it is true. It is DNA that we also do sometimes use more words. It's not that our words aren't as important, 
or as pointed, we just sometimes put more to it, which is not a bad thing. But I like the amplification too because I thought that was a great leadership principle you had as well. Yes, thank you. Um, so let's, let's jump into kind of a global topic. Um, Eva, you pointed out that globally women in cybersecurity only account for 11% of the workforce. And that percentage is way lower uh, for underrepresented technologists overall, but it is low in cybersecurity. Right. You're doing a lot. I so appreciate you and your team because you really are, you are a champion mm -hmm. of trying to drive diversity. Um, can you talk, I mean, I know I, on a personal level, I know some of the things you're doing, but can you talk a little bit more about some of the programs you're doing at Trend Micro to drive impact? Uh, we do have the program that uh, globally we try to recruit the uh, recruit from um, non-traditional, like mm -hmm. for instance, for, uh, we, we have a program in uh, Egypt and our leader, uh, Hernan, mm -hmm. was, uh, yeah, is here, he is yeah. leading that effort. We go to uh, Egypt and uh, create the program to teach cybersecurity. And then we hire some of them and we deploy some of them. And the most important thing is that we make sure 50% of them are the new graduate women, oh, women fantastic. in Egypt. And uh, they, we, we got a lot of smart people from that program. Also, we have uh, this uh, Catch the Flag. We have the Catch the Flag, uh, the, the cyber security battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was so happy that this year, every year I try to encourage women to join this type of uh, Catch right. the uh, Flag. This year, we have an all-woman team from Croatia oh. got into the final of our Tokyo uh, CTF. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I think it's just globally, we, um, we are very dis distributed yeah. uh, company. And um, we try this type of program to make sure that in each of the different culture, different uh, country, we will have diversity and uh, yeah. include more women into the midst. I think that's great. I mean, it, it is important. I think each and every one of these programs really matter. Uh, Lakeisha, have you found, I mean, you represent, you do such, I've, I've seen you now a few times present. You're always so elegant and smart and you represent you. what you do so well as both a small business and growing in a technology industry. Have you found ways that, you know, have gotten more diversity in general? How, you know, programs that you think work? Are you doing anything uh, that you want to point out? Well, definitely. I mean, from the top down for our organization, we're diverse. You know, it starts with the leadership, yeah. <laughs> it starts with me, and it starts with um, majority of my, um, my, my, my management team, is, which is 100% women. Um, and, um, and so that diversity sort of, um, sort of is woven throughout everything that we do from sourcing and, you know, hiring folks to um, retaining those folks as well. Um, but outside of that, though, um, with the various obstacles that I know that I have um, received as being um, someone who's a, my, a triple minority in a sense, um, is that um, you sort of have to motivate yourself to get through the various barriers that are in, mm -hmm. in front of you. And um, one of the suggestions that I have is, um, from a personal motivational perspective, is um, arming myself with the right book, books that will motivate me to, to stay in the right mindset. Um, and some of those books that, you know, that I use personally are like Rise and Grind by uh, Damon John. Um, I Needed This Today by Hoda Kotb, um, which is story, inspirational stories to, to get you through. Um, music is a big thing too. So I, I'm a really firm believer that music is the soundtrack of life. So you I have to love personal Danny's keynote then. Yes, well, I, lo I love. <laughs> he always does great music. I literally have playlists for different type parts of the day, different activities, different projects. I would highly recommend others as well. When you know you have a huge project task, uh, my team knows I'm very visual. So like it's the Hunger Games during the end of fiscal year, um, and so we actually show the Hunger Games and I'm Katniss, of course, and and we focus on it. And it's that sort of um, environment where we can be playful. Um, but, and mindful of um, the objectives, but making sure that we are motivated to keep moving together yeah. and that we're motivated individually in making sure that we are um, knocking down those, those individual barriers. That's great. That's really, I love that. What, how fun, what a fun. I love to dance. I always have dance. <laughs> I have a dance party here every year. So I love that. It's, I think, and it's fun. It gets people 
kind of mm -hmm. thinking about something besides work, but moving, movement, so. And I have one more thing to add to. I would also say um, developing affinity groups mm -hmm. within your organization and even externally, if you join affinity groups like um, SWE, Society for Women Engineers, NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers, um, for me, NABO, um, the National Association of Women Business Owners, et cetera, WeBank, there's various um, organizations that can make you feel more included if you feel that you are excluded in certain environments. And so there's tons of, of, of affiliations and networks um, that you can align yourself with. They're all out there. Um, so definitely you know, afford yourself. I think that's a really good, you know, a lot of women will tell me, men have a lot of groups and things they'll do and women are just now starting to do more things like that. I think in the US in some countries, I don't see it, I was in Colombia a year or so ago, where, wherever I go try to get women's groups together. And I had this round table in Colombia with I always say, find me the most important women that can influence that you can in this country or city. And we, we got these women together, they were amazing. And I, and I tried to organize and manage it so we could do a luncheon, introduce ourselves, and have maybe one idea of something we could do to promote new careers in technology. I couldn't get them to stop talking. And I was like, okay, this is not going well. We're, never, we're, gonna, we're not gonna get through four people in two hours. And what I found out is that these women said to me, we've never done anything like this. Mm -hmm. And so what I found out is the women don't get together and come together for these activities. So I said, well, you have to start doing this. So it's sometimes you realize even in every culture is just a little bit different. So Amy, I wanted to talk to you. S&P has a mentoring program that now is in its 15th year. And one of the statistics I came across was that the mentees and mentors who participate in the program are 8% more likely to advance laterally or vertically within the company than people who didn't participate in the mentoring program. I think that's a really awesome statistic. Can you talk about this program a little bit, how it runs and uh, you know how it builds an inclusive and diverse workforce? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, of course, and, and I think you talked about this a little bit, Keisha, if you don't have a support system and a network, it's really hard to advance your career, especially if you're in a large company. Mm -hmm. And so S&P does provide uh, mentoring. It, there are formal programs as well as informal programs. Um, and it really is up to the mentee to drive that relationship um, and really have a purpose as you're going into a mentoring relationship. I had very, very strong, good mentors um, early on in my career, and I still use those capabilities today. The other thing that we really focus on is inclusion. And you had mentioned the affinity groups. We call them employee resource groups. We have nine of them. They are global. Um, they're in almost every country that S&P is in as well. And we focus on providing employees with groups that align with their interests, regardless mm -hmm. of what that interest is. Um, we touch upon a lot of areas that you talked about as well. And we think in those groups also focus on mentoring, they focus on the community, um, giving back and building that network within a large company to help navigate, help employees feel included um, and get support where they need them. We have parents groups, we have women's groups, et cetera. Um, we also focus not just on the inclusion, and in which we do think is part of a really good strategy for retention, but we also focus on building the pipeline. Yeah. So ensuring that we're bringing in top talent that is diverse is very important to the company as well. So we partner with diverse organizations like Power to Fly and Grace Hopper. We partner um, with SHEP, which is the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. We partner with the National Black MBA um, and other organizations like Year Up. If you haven't heard of Year Up, definitely take, look them up, uh, do a little research on them. Amazing program for underprivileged youth, uh, mostly in larger cities, um, but providing them with training and then internships and then jobs at the end of it. And so it's a great opportunity, again, to tap into talent, like you were mentioning, Eva, yeah. mm -hmm. that isn't always tapped into, and especially in, in technology. And we found that to be very successful at bringing in new talent into the organization as well. I love that. So let me tell you, we have about 10 minutes left. I'm gonna do kind of a quick round and ask the ladies a question. And then we have some time for uh, questions from the audience. And if you have a question, um, there's two microphones here that you can each go up to. So we'll take maybe about 
um, seven or eight minutes for questions after this one. So I'll give you a chance to think about what your questions are. We already um, have a line, Teresa. What? There's well, be a good. Line. Well, you all have one more thing. This is the action <laughs> quick round. Y'all ready? We're going to start with you, you, and you. Okay. And if you have more than one piece of advice. So I always like to end the sessions by giving everyone an action to take away that they can do something with. So in each of your views, what's one practical go do that you recommend to your audience to embrace a growth mindset? Eva, let's start with you. I would say the mentor program, but always aside the mentor and mentee, totally different person. Mm -hmm. Agre I totally love that. different one. And uh, make sure that they talk their way. I like that. Amy? Um, for me, I would say evaluate where you're spending your time. So really take an honest look at yourself, who you're surrounding yourself with, and surround yourself with the people that build your energy and that don't drain it. Mm -hmm. Lakeisha? I would say lead by example. Um, you guys have an opportunity to meet others that are in this audience, so you know that they're open um, to wanting to advance their careers, and most importantly, uh, to share um, with you. So start today um, by networking and um, making sure that you're sharing your experiences with those around you. And that includes starting today with just those who are sitting right next to you on your row. I'm gonna give you one. Go write your own job description. <laughs> Decide what you wanna do next, write your job description, take it to your manager and say, here's what I wanna do and here's why I'm gonna be great at doing it. I did that. I've never taken a job in the last 15 years that I didn't write my own job description. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you'll be successful. All right, so we have, I love this, we have a line. Can you tell us your name, where you're from, and then your question? Uh, my name is Andrew Schillinger uh, from Atlanta. Um, so it's a bit of a long question. Thank you very much for uh, each of you for, for being up there talking. As a, a father of daughters, it's very important for me to see uh, this kind of going now. Um, I identify first as a dad. I also identify as an ally. Uh, I am allying with ladies in tech. I'm doing writing. And I'm putting myself out here in ways that make me very uncomfortable. But I am a male who has light colored skin. I have privilege and therefore people in power make space. People not in privilege make noise. It is my duty and my responsibility to make space. Can you talk to other allies in the room? Can anybody raise their hand if you identify as an ally? Thank you. Awesome. Can you please speak um, to the allies in the room of what we can do? Because everything you were talking about was great, but it's all about reaching out, pushing through your discomfort zone mm -hmm. to those who need. But what about for those who are able to put their hand out. Can you please speak to what you would like to see? It's a great question, ladies. So he's asking, how do, what do allies do to be more proactive to, to drive diversity and inclusion? I think that's mm -hmm. ideas. I think you've already done it. Yeah. I'd love to applaud you for standing yes. up and, and saying right. that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I well, I, I think um, some allies can, can serve on panels for review panels for candidates um, and, and reviewing pipeline candidates um, for your organizations, um, being on performance review panels as well, so that way you can be behind the scenes um, to push uh, a, a deserving employee forward. Um, and also, most importantly, um, even though you may not be a part of that affinity group that I mentioned before, still participating and making those um, those people who are part of those affinity groups continue to feel included. Yeah, the, and I really like you start with, uh, I'm the father of three daughters. Yeah. Bring that mindset into your, into your uh, work and uh, always think, what if this happened to my daughter? Yeah, I, yeah. I think really that good. would it's help real, a it's lot. so <laughs> true. I, the, men, the men leaders at Amazon ask this question a lot, and the one thing I say to them, look, you make sure that you're giving uh, the diverse individuals in your organization a voice. Look around and make sure you ask them for questions. You give them projects. You let them lead things. You make sure that you have a diverse organization. You, you are an ally as a leader of doing it. So I think the group's right. You've started off the right way. You're here and you're asking questions. So thank you for that. Thank you. Can I add one more small thing before we move on? 
When you see it not being equal, right, it's up to you to call it out. Because the people that are feeling um, not included or that are shying away um, may not feel that they have that voice. And so that's where that partnership really could come in. Um, and where I think I, I've had that in the past as well, where others have stepped up for me when I wasn't comfortable stepping up for myself. And, and that's a great way, even if you just have to pull someone aside and say, hey, you know, you did this. Like, it might not have felt good to others in the room. That's a great, great way to be supportive. Thank you. All right, Thank next you. person. Cheryl Miller from the Digital Leadership Institute. And I just wanted to share, um, first, thank you to Teresa, of course, being um, the leader on this topic in her organization and globally. Um, but to all of you, we could all kind of float out of this room thinking that everything is fantastic. But I just want to um, share a statistic that is that the, wor the World Economic Forum has told us that girls of the age of six already feel that they are undervalued by society. Mm -hmm. um, so then when we, of course, grow into adult women um, and get into that mindset of, it's kind of a victim mindset, I guess, where I, I, I want to discourage stepping away, right? Where indeed we have to sit at the table. Um, how do we, you know, us gathering here is already a great step, but how do we leverage your power at the table more broadly, you know, and I think take up some of these recommendations to those that, are, that have the lockdown on the, the decision making? Um, how do we, impact that um, uh, proactively day to day? You know, how do we make that change? Ladies, how do we impact them more I, for the ladies? I think, yeah, Cheryl, what you're asking is, how do we take what we've done in this room and take it outside this room and make sure that we kind of each and every one are advocate to push it forward. Is, mm -hmm. is that kind of your question? I want to make sure, I don't want to explain what you're telling, but the, the, one of the things, I'm sorry, the microphone's not great either, so sorry about that. Um, does that make sense? Like what can we do to push more outside of this room and, and kind of amplify Host that? a meeting like this, host a, a conference like that. Force multiply, right? Right, what we're multiply, doing here. several of them. Yeah. Well, and Cheryl, I'll say, was a great advocate. She started a coding club in Brussels that she would bring girls in and say, um, we're get, you're going to do fashion. I, I got to speak at her club, and she would say, you're going to do fashion. Well, what they didn't know is when they showed up, she was teaching them how to code, <laughs> to deliver fashion. <laughs> and then they had their fashion everywhere, and there were some amazing girls that showed up, and I'm sure they're still working in that. And I think that it, right there, it's these little things you can do, clubs, promoting. Um, also, you know, with, with girls, I, I never knew what I didn't know. My dad was a basketball coach and I was in the fray all the time. <laughs> and I think, you know, making them always feel they can do whatever anybody else can do, right? It's a mindset that we have to encourage. But I'm also reminded around the world when I go to places like Africa and India, you have things that uh, culture that are much harder to overcome. We're very blessed in this country. We do not have the same issues uh, that many places around the world face. And when I talk to these women, I feel beyond blessed. So we have cultures, uh, some of these things are much easier to do and much, much, much harder to do in other parts of the world. But I think it's our obligation to help around the world, not just here in the United States of America, for sure. Teresa, can I add one more thing? Um, I think that we should also look at um, other avenues as far as starting your own business as well. I took the step, others have taken the step, we're actually the largest group of entrepreneurs at, at this point um, within the country. So um, feel motivated, especially when you look at our counterparts throughout most of this conference, um, feel motivated to start your own company and, and, and promote others to start their own companies as well. So that's some, uh, I think that's a, a broader discussion um, yeah. that needs to be held. Um, to motivate and, and to, um, of course, advance the obstacles, um, advance the overcoming of the obstacles that we, we currently have. We're going to do two quick ones. We're going to do you and you uh, very fast. We have about another minute, so introduce yourself, please. 
Hi, uh, I'm Melissa Linehan. I'm from Maryland. I work for Smartronics, and I am a systems administrator. My question would be, uh, what advice do you have for younger women who are early on in their careers when they experience things that I'm sure everyone here has, the, the micro-sexism of just because I'm speaking in a firm voice, I'm bossy, instead of if I was the male next to me, oh, he's just very smart, and he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I'll take up the remainder of the time, so I can't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it happens. If you all don't think it happens, it, it happens all the time. It, it still happens to me, and I and I'm sure it still happens to, to everybody on this panel at some point. It's very important to speak up for yourself. It's very important, again, to find those allies and, and those people surrounding you that know your value. Um, and again, I'll go back to something that I said. If the culture isn't right for you, sometimes you have to evaluate that. Um, it, and there's also a way to change it. There, there is a way to say to those people that you work with, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, like, look, I'm gonna tell you what you did to me. I've had that conversation with someone that is a coworker of mine and has been a coworker of mine for years. And we've had that conversation a couple of times where I've had to say, you know, you did this to me again. You said the exact same thing I said two more times after I said it. <laughs> um, and it's important to have those conversations. And if you don't, you become a little resentful. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, and it's not good for the other person. They might not even know that they're doing it. Thank you, by the way. Last question. Hi, I'm Krishna Nariminti. I'm from Los Angeles. From um, where? LA, Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the panel. Um, I, I, I founded and run a women empowering group for like seven plus companies we have. And all these topics are so important to me. So thank you for that. And uh, in our uh, group, uh, we value like men are a very important part of the group because they are equally important to make a difference. So like, I'm, I thank all men here too for being here. And uh, my question, I have two questions. So one quick, uh, one question is how do you see men empowering women? And uh, two is any books that change your, uh, m help you grow? I would love to know. So books for growth and how do, what was the How do you one? see men empowering women? How do you see men involving women? Mm. I share the book I read and I always uh, advocate about it is uh, Good to Great. Yeah. Good to Great. That, uh, and the, the chapter I like most is talking about the hedgehog. What are you good at? What are you passionate about? And your business model would all integrate together. If you can find your hedgehog and be yourself, then that's the best way. So the book that I like, always it's is that good, it's from good, Jim yeah. Collins, good to great. Yeah, I, I like what you said earlier about men and others participating and ensuring that your panels are diverse and, and your interviewing panels are diverse and your promotional panels are diverse and really making sure that you're looking at an entire population of people, not just, oh, these are my go-tos, right? These are the two or three that always come up in my head. Um, I think it's important as leaders, whether you're male or female or however you're identifying, to be able to do that in order to open your mind and, and really see who are the, the valuable employees in your organization. Yeah. And last but not least, um, there's two books that were really instrumental for me. One is The uh, Minding Organization by Dr. Firestein and Rubenstein. And another big one is Barbara Waugh's um, Soul in a Computer. And she's amazing if you haven't seen her speak. And her book is, is amazing about diversity and inclusion, and um, in particular within the, the tech, um, the private sector tech field, uh, and being a, uh, a woman um, who battled a lot of barriers um, in a large IT corporation. Thank you so much. I love Good to Great too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And by the way, just we really appreciate you all spending the time with us today. I hope that you leave here with some new ideas and concepts. We want your feedback. If there's things that you'd like to see more of, how we could make these panels and programming we have around We Power Tech more powerful and impactful, please, please, please give us that feedback. 
And I want to thank my amazing panelists for taking the time and being here with us. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.